Were there more highly developed civilizations than now? Did Atlantis exist? Mainstream um, experts often discard uh, Plato's descriptions of Atlantis as being just a myth woven into this story that never really existed. Is that civilizations have been developing for many millennia, and there is a cyclicity of global catastrophes that change the face of Earth forever. And, and what it tells us is that the ancient people knew that when these cycles happen, they can often come with great destruction. In the South American Andes, in the mountains, at 4,200 meters above sea level, geologists have found traces of marine sediments. In the same area, some of the ruins in Chivanaca, at 4,300 meters, were covered with a 2-meter layer of liquid mud. The source of the flooding couldn't be found. We can see that this all was dragged and piled up by some force. There is no doubt Tiwanaka's death was caused by a natural disaster that occurred more than 12,000 years ago. Scientists are endlessly arguing about the nature of this singularity. But what is really essential is that with all this variety of legends, the main thing is always passed on to the descendants, namely there was a global catastrophe that almost completely destroyed mankind and that these events happen cyclically and they are connected with cosmic factors. And now we have faced these processes. We are living in times of global climate change, which happen every 12,000 years. Various megalithic structures and legends of the people of the world are trying to warn us about this. When we look at ancient structures around the world that we still get access to that aren't deep underneath the ocean, as we mentioned, um, it was brought up that ocean levels were significantly lower during the last ice age, known as the Younger Dryas period. In fact, ocean levels were around 400 feet lower than they are today. So the structures that we still have evidence for that are on the surface have been studied somewhat extensively. And what they find that's really the most amazing to me is that one of the main focuses of these ancient civilizations, when we find megalithic precision and sophistication in those structures that prove that they're older than this more modern time frame that we're, we're looking at, this five or 6,000 year time frame, but, but obviously they're, because of the evidence we're seeing and their sophistication and the way that they were built, we've, and the evidence from the cataclysms and disasters that have sometimes melted and burned these structures, we know that they're much older. And one of the most co common things we find, the themes in these civilizations, is that they needed an astronomical temple as their focal point. They, these ancient cultures realized that these cycles occur on a basis of about every 12,000 years or so. And because of that, instead of being wiped out, they knew that the most significant thing that they could do was to not only map the heavens to know when they were coming, but also to be ready for them and be able to disseminate that knowledge to pass it on so that if that culture was destroyed, that that later culture would be able to carry on that torch of that previous one. So what, you know, what is going on with these cycles? How do they, what's causing them and, and what is this disaster that destroyed Atlantis? One of the most amazing things about when you study these temples today, go look at Gobekli Tepe or Menorca off of Spain or Malta or anywhere throughout the Mediterranean or in these ancient areas, we find that these temples, in order to be a functional temple to study the heavens, to understand these cycles, is the first thing you'd have to do is align yourself with magnetic north and south. That would be the first and most important thing because then once you did that, you could have this accurate way to, to assess and watch the movement of the cosmos to track what is known as this great year, this 26, about 26,000 year cycle between what is spread across the 12 different zodiacs. And those cycles are about 2,100 years per zodiac. And these cultures knew that. But what's fascinating is that when they study these temples that were mapping those changes, they find that they're no longer matching magnetic north and south all over the world. Almost every single one of these temples, when they, when they first, when they identify that they're older than some of the more primitive ones that were built later, they find that they're all off from magnetic north and south by about 23 degrees. 
And what that means is that when those temples were built, that when they had aligned to north and south, they were exactly dead on north to, to magnetic north and south. For them to be off by 23 degrees on a global scale means that we had a disaster so significant or disasters, I will point out, maybe multiples over the course of a 12 to 24,000 year over the last two processional cycles. What we're looking at is those changes to mag magnetic north and south because they don't align up anymore shows you that those shifts were so significant that where we now have north and south magnetically is in a different place than it used to be back then and that gives us a glimpse especially when we look at things like studying ley lines these energetic convergence zones across the world they're no longer in the same place either so what we find is that there was a massive shift in the magnetic field of the earth and so that it's no longer in the same position that it used to be back then but what's brilliant about that is it gives us a ballpark to understand when those temples were built because all we have to do is study when those alignments matched up with magnetic north and south and then we know when they were built it gives us this time frame so what happened right there's been a lot of really good information mentioned by a lot of these speakers over the last several minutes talking about what causes these cycles. And I would absolutely agree with everything that's been said. It seems like it's focused around this movement of, the, of our solar system within the cosmos and how the sun goes through these grand solar maximums and grand solar minimums changes where it flares up and becomes strong and then it gets weaker over time. And every one of those shifts, we go from being really warm on the planet to being plunged into an ice age and, and up and down, vice versa. And that's why we find no ancient megalithic structures across the, the far northern hemisphere. None. Because they were, they were buried under ice. And those ancient cultures would have known not to build there. And so today we find this area across the central part of our planet around the Mediterranean, Turkey, Mesopotamia, Egypt, across across the other side of the Atlantic to you know, places like in um, in Peru and Bolivia and South America, up through up through the Americas, all these megalithic structures are built al along that area, showing us that that was where the climate was favor favorable at that time. And they knew that if they built there, that those ice caps that would accumulate every twelve thousand years would, or depending on which cycle you're in, would not affect them. And so these ancient cultures were brilliant. They understood all these aspects of our world and cycles that we're just beginning to understand today. And so in terms of Atlantis, one of the things that's interesting about it is, like it's been mentioned, how it's in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the area that's today of the Azores, we find this interaction of three different plates that come together along this mid-Atlantic ridge that stretches across the middle of the Atlantic. If you imagine a continent on that spot, it would really be one of the worst locations on the planet if you had one of these cycles occur because the closer you are in proximity to these locations the more damage and and the more intense those cataclysms would be it doesn't mean that if you weren't near them you wouldn't have any damage it just means that the closer you are to those epicenters of wherever those plates would move would be the most dangerous place to be and so what would happen well you have if you have a magnetic north south that are balancing this our planet Think of it as this perfect balance. And if you get increased amounts of solar radiation because of the sun going through these changes, blasting the planet, what you have is those poles start to shift. And there's two different types of movements that occur. There's what's known as a wobble and there's what's known as a shift. Right now, we're in a wobble. And you you go up and you follow the news of what what's been going on the last couple of years and looking into the Inuit of northern Canada, they've already talked about how the magnetic north has been starting to shift. It's already moving. Question is, how far is it going to move? Because there's a very fine line between a wobble and a shift before everything all hell breaks loose. And so what we're looking at is, you know, are we at that point where that is going to be prevented or? Is this going to continue the way it's going? So what happened to Atlantis? Well, according to records, they may have intensified a natural event that was already occurring. And, we'll, and they will be getting into this later as, as people talk about some technologies and different aspects of what Atlantis had. But either way, Atlantis, this continent that Plato described, 
being on the epicenter of these plate changes as that those things were occurring with the magnetic north and south changing and then having tectonic plates all start moving and volcanism across the planet this entire continent as Plato described it's not as in a, as, as if a tsunami just washed over and then destroyed it all and left it sitting there it's actually mentioned that these events Plato says they're so severe that the entire continent submerged and sank in the Atlantic. And we had some great analysis by, by Liza talking about those geologic processes that occur that lead to that and how all these strange anomalies out in the Azores prove that it looks like there was some kind of a continent here based on the flora and fauna and all the different types of evidence geologically that's remained in this part of the ocean. But this, so this part of Atlantis essentially, to conclude, it looks like as these violent earth changes were occurring, some parts of Atlant the Atlanteans fled the continent and created what we think of as Egypt or Chem at the time to protect this knowledge. And then those who remained on that island were wiped out and just submerged under the ocean and disappeared and became myth. And that's what we're left with is, is really by studying this, we can understand both what happened to Atlantis, but also to understand how we can prevent not only these cataclysms, but some of the mistakes and some of the things that they that those cultures did that we really do need to learn by. You know, that famous quote is, those who can't learn from the past are destined to repeat it. And so we are at this critical moment now where we have to start taking a hard look at Atlantis. Instead of thinking of it as a myth, we have to just really get into the science of what it was so that we can understand our own story, but also understand where we're going in the future. And that's a delicate balance that I think we have to really be careful of. Thank you very much, Matt. As far as I understand from what you've said, that ancient knew about this cycle of 12,000 years. They wanted to kind of show this uh, cycle to us in the megalithical structures so that we would get this information. It's very interesting what the scientific world knows about this 12,000 year cycle. If we go back to, uh, if we address the changes that happened over the last 12,000 years, basically uh, there were sharp uh, climate change, sharp warming, a change of the uh, currents, ocean currents, uh, a stoppage of the Gulf Stream, which was uh, accompanied by hurricanes and other uh, anomalies. Also, the uh, sharp increase of the ocean temperature, which we can, uh, which we know from the sediment data, and also disastrous floods that uh, are indicated by the sediments which are found in various parts of the world, and also a speedified uh, sediment uh, layers. As Matt mentioned, there was the sharp uh, change of the magnetic field activity and also the volcanic and uh, tectonic processes uh, were get act more active. And scientists uh, also detected the demographic disaster out of uh, 500 million, um, 500 million uh, uh, people population they decreased to 50 million, at least according to the current scientific data. So, uh, actually, uh, now uh, when I was reading about this information, actually, it all it is all repeated now. It is what we see on the uh, news. This is actually what is happening to our civilization right now. Many scientists already calculated and have a scientific understanding that there is a cycle of 12,000 years and after the end of each of these cycles there is a disaster and please turn on the video despite the uh, taboo in the scientific world many scientists say that today uh, that on the planet everything happens with a certain cyclicity including the global climate change a logical question arises of course of global cataclysm, what are the cycles in fact? Cyclicity is the basis of the existence of humanity and the universe. Cyclicity comes from the Greek word kyklos, a circle, a combination of interconnected nominal processes that make a complete circle of development within a certain period of time. Naturally, the activity of many natural processes on the planet Earth depends on the cosmic cycles.
Гнёнка Владимир studied the cycles of the development of Earth, astrophysical, geological, biological and historical. It turned out that all of them subordinate to the great cycle of the change of uh, ages, which lasts 11,911 years. This is the number uh, equivalent to the periods of rotation of all the planets around the Sun. But Turin Alexander Mikhailovich asserted that planets rotate around their center of masses in the direction perpendicular to the flatness of their orbit. As a result of such rotation, Earth is from time to time rotates in space uh, up to, uh, on 360 circular degrees. And uh, actually, global catastrophes take place due to this with a period of 12,166 years. The main reason of the climate change today is the change that takes place on the Sun, but the climate change on Earth can also have a galactic origin also, which relates to the transition of the Sun and the solar system through a spiral, um, spiral slit of our galaxy. In the scientific work of Petrov, Nikolai Vasilievich, of the climate change uh, is described from the position of the preservation of life in space. The uh, constant nature of the parameters on, uh, of the environment on the crosses, crust of the Earth, uh, including climate, uh, has an auxiliary nature, and uh, the rotation around the center of galaxy has the period of 2000. Uh, 217 million years. It turns out that during this period, the solar system makes uh, 8,000 zodiacal uh, spirals on the spiral trajectory. Thanks to this, the reason the changing of polarity of the external magnetic field changes and uh, our uh, solar system, uh, every uh, 13,000 years, our planetary system switches from magnetic field of the Milky Way, of one, uh, one zodiacal sign to another. Now we have the transition from the constellation of Leo to the constellation of Aquarius. This means the deregulator of the energetical state of the solar system is the informational magnetic field of our galaxy. Every 12,000 years, the sun goes through these periods of time when the inner nucleus of energy within itself goes through these flare up events. And that just, and everything's always about this balance cycle in, in the cosmos. Everything follows that, where it, it flares up and gets hot, and then it goes through a period where it gets cool. And that's known as a grand solar maximum to a grand solar minimum, and then continuing that. That's how it works. Yes. Consider how the global warming and the climate change is influencing civilizations. And I would like to shift to the following question as uh, cycles of civilizations. And in order to um, discuss it, let's have a look at a couple of examples that destroy the theory of linear development of civilizations. And we will have archaeological findings as a proof. For example, the Great Sphinx in Egypt. Everyone knows it. It has been um, it has been created out of uh, one big rock. And Professor Dr. Robert Schock from Boston University at the beginning of 1990s impressed everyone with his statement. Um, he actually um, he did he studied the water erosion on the Sphinx. So the Sphinx body experienced uh, prolonged rains. And the problem was that actually the last time when such conditions happened in Egypt were from eight to 12,000 years ago. And geologists agree to that. They agree to this evident facts of water erosion, but actually it, um, mm, it provides a very inconvenient uh, basement for uh, the for Egyptologists and because they think that uh, the Sphinx appeared 4,000 years ago and another less common example is the Cambay city in the Gulf of Cambay it's the uh, Gulf of uh, Arabian Sea and this is a real city that was discovered 17 years ago one seven and um, um, it is difficult to study it because it is below the sea, well, sea level at 40 meters. And uh, people believe that uh, the Harappian civilization was the uh, used to be the ancient one, the most ancient one. But um, people found that uh, this uh, 
city was built, for example, existed 9,500 years ago. And uh, of course, now it's not the Arabian civilization that is the oldest. And I would like to logically say that probably these structures that uh, we see at, on the screen right now, probably they haven't been built below the water surface. Probably the theory is that they had been sunken. So again, it um, destroys the theory of the linear development of civilization because um, the, the water levels were rising so quickly around the last ice age, around 12,000 years ago. How do we connect Atlantis to these other civilizations, right? We see this sophisticated myth of this island continent, but how is it connected to the ancient Sumerians? How is it connected to the Hittites? How is it connected to any of these ancient cultures which we can identify megalithic structures? Like we just showed a few minutes ago, looking over in Peru at some of this incredible sophistication. How does Atlantis connect to all these cultures? Well, so specifically, it really revolves around what we can find for the earliest evidence we have is the Sumerians. Because when we look at two places, sources of evidence for that, cuneiform tablets that came out of Mesopotamia, one of the most important ones that we know of is called the Sumerian King List. And the other one's called the Uruk King List. And not everybody may know about that second one. But what those basically revolve around is it tells the story of these ancient cities in Mesopotamia and how old they are and the generations of kings that lived before them. And they state that their history goes back almost over, in some cases, 200,000 years. If you were to add up every single king and understand how they're recording time in the aspect of which was known as Shars, S-H-A-R, which re represented a time period of 3,600 years which that number is also mentioned in another cuneiform tablet called the Atrahasis. So what we find is that these ancient cultures have different epics that occurred where some of them were wiped out and then they had to rebuild again. But what, one of the things that really stands out is that we don't have specific examples of kingship and information going from Sumer to creating Atlantis. But we know that Sumer predated Atlantis because it's stated in cuneiform tablets that Eridu in what's today known as Iraq is the oldest city ever, the first city ever created on Earth, and, and which has biblical connections to Eden. However, what we find is a gap in information after Sumer with these kings, with this emergence of this great empire, this great continent called Atlantis, which was then wiped out and then records began again. But this gap in between where we find this lost history of Atlantis seems to indicate that those many of those records may have been destroyed in, in these cataclysms and what we find in Egypt, where Plato talked to Solon and Solon had the story from Egypt. And then I read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. That's some of the only evidence we have that really talks about what Atlantis was like and, and how it was connected. But really, when you lay all those pieces together, you find that Atlantis looks like, like the perfection of those lost civilizations. It's when they reach the peak of their, their sophistication that would became Atlantis. It was all the meg megalithic, sophisticated knowledge from all the cultures that culminated to this great civilization we think of as Atlantis. Um, Experts often discard uh, Plato's descriptions of Atlantis as being just a myth woven into this story that never really existed. Well, what, whereas when you start to break down these writings of Plato, you find that he gives very descriptive analysis of this great place that once ex existed, that when I do ancient research and studying across these um, ruins and ancient megalithic structures around the world, it seems that these cultures were all connected at one time to this lost knowledge that in many ways we're st still trying to regain today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break down the Timaeus and Critias and do some readings directly from them so that everybody can hear exactly what Plato said about Atlantis. And instead of just having someone tell you what they think he said. So what we're gonna do is start with what's known as the Timaeus. So where did that story come from? To give a little background, Plato was an Athenian philosopher who knew about another Athenian statesman and poet and philosopher named Solon. And this is where the story really begins, because Solon spent a considerable amount of time in Egypt in 590 BC. 
And he was there studying Egyptian ancient writings, and he found this entire story about, about Atlantis. Now, for those who don't know, it makes complete sense that that was where he would find that knowledge, considering that Egypt at the time had some of the oldest writings known to mankind. Many people are familiar with the Library of Alexandria that was burned down later by the Romans. But what that tells us is that Egypt contained these ancient records from our past. They really give us a glimpse into, well, what was Atlantis? How is it connected to some of these lost civilizations and global societies that once existed, that had sophisticated knowledge and technologies that in some ways we don't even have today? So I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a section from the Timaeus to, to get us started to understand what Atlantis was and where was it and, and the description of what happened to it. So beginning in the Timaeus, it states, For the ocean there was at that time navigable, for in front of the mouth which you Greeks call, you say, the pillories of Hercules, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together. It was possible for travelers of that time to cross from it to other islands and from the islands to the whole continent over against them, which encompasses the variability of the ocean. For all that we have been here, lying within the mouth of which we speak, is evidently having a narrow entrance but that yonder is a real ocean and the land surrounding it most rightly be called in the fullest and truest sense, a continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there existed a confederation of kings of great and marvelous power, which held sway over all the island and over many other islands, also in parts of the continent. So right away we find out that instead of this, this myth, we're learning about this great civilization, not on just some little island that disappeared, but an entire continent connected to other islands that played a huge role in our past and our history. And it goes on to mention how these great kings carried on and ruled over the people and had great power. And that's what we're going to get into a little deeper. But as we go along, we find out even more descriptive analysis of Atlantis when we get into the Critias. The Critias really is the heart of where Plato describes that Egyptian knowledge of what Atlantis was. And so let's lay the framework. I'm going to start with just a little bit of the beginning of the Critias, and then we'll get into some of the um, description of what happened to Atlantis. But it begins by saying, it, Plato describes how Atlantis was Poseidon carved out of a mountain, a great palace enclosed by moats of various width, essentially. And he talks about how Atlantis was separated by these moats of water with circular islands of land. And we'll get into that in a second. And he goes on to mention how the center of the island was a great temple known as the Temple of Poseidon. And, and on and on, how great land bridges connected Atlantis and how it was, like, it was a center of trade and commerce in the region. And so reading directly from the Critias, he goes on after he describes it all, and we'll go over that in a second. He goes on to describe what happened to Atlantis. And so in the Critias, I'm going to read directly from it. It states, but afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and floods. And in a single day and night of misfortune, all of your warlike men in a body sank into the earth. And the island of Atlantis, like manner, disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Okay, so let's break that down for a second for a minute. As I said before, Plato describes how Atlantis was a large continent found west of the Pillars of Hercules. For those who study, they know that the Pillars of Hercules was this known as the Straits of Gibraltar. Now, west of that area, just northwest of, of Morocco, Africa, we find all these different island chains that are still left over, found what's along what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, an area where tectonic plates come together and can be a violent area for earthquakes and volcanism and, and huge tsunamis if you get violent earth changes. And so today, when, when I look at that region and I look at what, how he described Atlantis, it brings up questions like, as in, you know, were the Azores, Canary Islands, were these what parts of Atlantis? So what, what Plato essentially says is, states that Atlantis had a central island surrounded by two circular island landmasses with three areas of water. Now, where it was built 
wasn't actually on a small island surrounded by ocean, but actually on the continent itself. And it describes how there was a, a narrow area of land that was connecting from the ocean to this area of, of central land masses in an island in the center. So ships would essentially come from the ocean and they would travel up through this nar narrow area that was heavily guarded. And that he, he later describes as sinking and submerging into the ocean and completely disappearing and, and leaving nothing behind except an, a shoal of mud that is impassable by ships. And so that's, he basically tells us that Atlantis in a day and a night was completely wiped out and destroyed. What do ancient legends of peoples of the world tell us? How broad are the circles that spread from the flood in the mythological memory? All in all, over 500 legends of this kind are known in the world. In the rainforest of Malaysia, the Chiwan people believe that time to time their world, which they called Earth-7, is turned upside down. The legend of ancient Greece says that there were four races on Earth before present mankind, and each one was observed by a geological cataclysm at the appointed hour. Ancient Egyptian legends also mention the Great Flood. In China, for example, past eras was called Kiss. At the end of each kiss, the sea leaves their coastlines. Human beings and everything else die, and the ancient traces are erased. The myth of the Hopi Indians said that the Third world ended in a universal flood in the book Maya, Popul Vuh. Flooding is associated with heavy hail, black rain, fog, and indescribable cold. Sacred Buddhist book speaks of the seven suns. Each of them is destroyed by water, fire, or wind. The legends of the aborigines of Sarwak or Sawak from Ocean Area remind us that six suns have died. The world is now being lit by the seventh sun. In the history of the Dakota Indians, the Iroquois myth is told of how sea and water once came to Earth destroying all human life. The inhabitants of the Tierra del Fuego said the sun and the moon fell from the sky, and the Chinese said that the planet has changed their direction. In the hymn of the Viracocha, recorded by Pachacutiyanki, there is the term Anacocha, literally means the sea from above, which had direct relation to the starry sky. Yet whatever this myth means, the sources of the impended flood were somewhere outside in the astronomical sphere.